Start on? Yes. We've had the thumb up from the events team present, so we're ready to go. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Henry Hill, the Deputy Editor of Conservative Home. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you this Tuesday afternoon to our In Conversation with Tom Tugendhat, who really needs no introduction but is Minister for Security. Um, as I'm sure you'll know at this point, this is, this is a standard con home event. Tom and I, please close the door, are going to have a chat for about probably 10 to 15 minutes because we're running slightly behind, after which I'm we will... To be impressed, Tom. <laughs> uh, Michael, I'm here to help. There we go. After which we will throw it open to questions. Um, because we are running behind and this is only a 45 minute event to begin with, I, and also it's, it's Tuesday, this is my eighth event, I am going to be really savage with questions. Uh, you get two sentences and one question mark. Um, and that's it. And I will start talking over you immediately after you've exhausted those options. Uh, just so you're warned and you have time to work on them. Uh, He's here to defend democracy, not to practice it. Absolutely. Well, no, the, 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 the chair is not an elected position. My mandate comes from God. Um, uh, anyway, I'm going to kick. I'm going I'm I'm to precisely... Precisely, we stand in the imperial presence, and we're very grateful for it. Uh, Tom, I'm going to kick off. Uh, obviously, I think the biggest one that you're that you're known for on the security front is China. Now, there's yeah. been a huge U-turn, almost effectively a U-turn in the in the government's approach towards China, even within this period of conservative government. You know, I remember when George Osborne was chancellor, and we had those Chinese flags all over Whitehall uh, to today. So, why is China, in your view, such the threat that it is? Well, look. It's not a secret to say that there are many countries that threaten the UK in various different ways. And some of them bring sort of support to terrorism or attacks inside the UK or things like that. The one difference, the real big difference between China and the others, the others are trying to win the game. They're trying to, they're trying to get advantage. They're trying to set themselves up to be a bit stronger. China's trying to change the rules. China's trying to rewrite the rules and fundamentally unpick the system that has kept us safe and prosperous for 80 years or so years. That is a huge threat to the whole world, but it's a particular threat to the United Kingdom. The reason is, it's not much of a secret, we wrote the rules. We were very actively part of writing the rules. Yes, we inherited some of them from the Dutch, some of them from the Americans, and some of them we did with our European friends. But the reality <coughs> is, they're British rules. They underpin our service economy, they underpin our whole economy, and China's attempt to rewrite them are not just a threat to us internally, IP theft, influence, and other things like that. They're a direct threat to our economic future. Which rules in particular are you thinking of other than IP? If you had to pick sort of, is it, is it international law? Is it trade? Is it? Look, it's, it's pretty much everything. If you look at the way that China is playing in the UN system, if you look at the way that China is trying to influence trade, the way it's changing the E1, the way in which Chinese economic uh, ambition is changing the way in which some countries are able to trade freely and internationally, that is a direct challenge to those countries like us, which are based on international trade and the rule of law. So is that the qualitative difference between the threat posed by China and, say, the threat posed by a country like Iran, which is obviously run by a government that is deeply opposed to Western values, but as you, as you would put it, I think, is, is more trying to increase its leverage within the existing system. Is that simply a, a factor of size? Is it simply that Iran doesn't have the heft to do what China's doing, or is it something different? Well, look, what China's trying to do is global. What Iran's trying to do is regional. Now, I'm not saying that Iran is a friend. That would be laughable. Didn't suggest that you were, just to be clear. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and my popularity in Tehran is pretty similar to my popularity in Beijing and Moscow. I'm sanctioned from all three. Um, as an American friend of mine asked me only the other day, why am I so popular in Pyongyang? The, <laughs> the reality is that what Iran is trying to do is trying to achieve its own advantage through regional hegemony or regional instability uh, by hitting our friends and our allies, by uh, sowing uh, death and destruction in countries like Syria, and by doing huge damage in countries that are nearby. What it's trying to do in the UK as you know very well, um, MI5 has warned about this, uh, is uh, attack targets here in the UK, Jewish targets, Israeli targets here in the UK, 15 attempts since the beginning of 2022. Uh, that's not good, but that is a regional play. What China's trying to do is change the rules completely. I see. Okay. And one of the things that um, Iran obviously does is it backs non-state taxes in neighboring That's states. Right. Like, how big a problem is this going to be? Because we've seen the emergence not just of you know, Iran traditionally, well, I say traditionally as if it's a long tradition, but, you know, back to the 80s, backs militias and so on. But now we have Russia, which has PMC Wagner, or what was until recently PMC Wagner, a very different type of non-state actor. How much of a problem is it that you've got so many countries that are operating outside what we would consider the conventional uh, rules of war? 
Look, I'm not going to lie to you, it's a challenge, right? It's a, it's a real challenge because traditionally what we're able to do is we're able to start at a point and follow uh, intelligence or influence officers, uh, IRGC, uh, Iranian intelligence service, whatever they happen to be, from a point and follow it down the line. The, the, the challenge that we have here is that the Iranian government is using criminal groups. It's using not just proxies in the sense that it's using Hezbollah as a proxy, those are sort of ideological proxies, but actually unconnected criminal groups. So in fact, some of the attempts that we've seen in the United Kingdom have no visible connection to Iran at all. They're not ideologically aligned. They're not, uh, they're not part of the Iranian diaspora in any way. They're simply being paid as a criminal group to conduct an action against a target in the UK. Now that's the kind of if you like, mercenary activity that we haven't seen in the UK for many, many years. And it's really threatening. And that's why uh, it's worth pointing out that any group, any group at all, that we find a link to Iran with will go way up on our target list. Fair. Now, before we kick over to the audience, I'm just going to, I'm going to move away from security slightly because I wouldn't be doing this if I were to make a little bit of mischief. Um, Oh dear. Well, there's been a there's been one of the sort of centerpieces of the row of this conference, as you say, as you might say, has been the row over sort of the role of, of government. There's a row over tax cuts, and there's a row over HS2 and all the rest of it. So I guess the question is, setting aside obviously your ministerial hat, which obviously you can never take off, but you can at least forget about for a minute, perhaps. You try. Um, <laughs> what do you think the proper role of the state is in conserv in in, uh, in a, under a conservative government? And uh, do you think it's too big, too small, too, less too ambitious? What well, let me let me start off by saying uh, I'm a conservative. I believe in competition. And part of that competition is the competition of ideas. Mm -hmm. So what I love about conservative conference is you do have competing ideas. And I think, by the way, that makes us better. That makes us stronger. It makes us richer as a party. It's a massive improvement on the sort of socialists who are going to be meeting in Liverpool who want one, one leader, one socialist church, one, one policy, one view. So you, you want know. more than one, sorry, you want more than one leader? Is that what we're taking away? <laughs> <laughs> You're not helping anyone. <laughs> Try over it. <laughs> no, no. Oh, God. Uh, that's the Greens, isn't it? Uh, the, oh, yeah, um, yeah, 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 precisely. Look, no, we've got, we, we've got a competition of ideas, and that's really healthy, actually. And one of the things that we as a party have always achieved is the ability to have competing ideas and coalesce around uh, the views that succeed and be pragmatic about what, uh, what, what we're looking to, 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 to conduct, what the policy we're looking to conduct. We're not ideolo ideological. So I think the, the reality is the nature of the, cha the state has to adapt to the circumstances that we find it in. And here's where, you know, I draw on the lessons, my first few lessons in government, frankly. When I first took this job, one of the first things uh, I had to help organize, and thank God some fantastic people in our security and intelligence services had already started long before I arrived, was the security of Her Late Majesty the Queen's funeral. Now, you may remember those extraordinarily dignified crowds queuing and waiting to see uh, Her Late Majesty's body lying in state. And it was a beautiful moment. It was a, a, a real moment of coming together. And for me, that's what security is about. Security is about creating the environment, creating the ability for people to live freely. It's not about directing. It's not about channeling. It's not about corralling. It's about creating that open platform. And that's what the state is about, fundamentally. The state isn't about telling you what you should invest in or not invest in, where you should work or not work, what, how your family should look, what your, you know, who you should love or who you should not love. You know, that's not what the state's job is. Mm -hmm. The state's job is to create a platform in which you can live free. And that is, I think, the job of a conservative government. And I think that's exactly what we are doing. Well, I'm sure people will have great fun decoding that over, over the next few weeks. Now, we're moving on because we started a bit late. And you're not here for me. So let's have a show of hands, please. And remember the firm injunction. You get two sentences and one question mark. Uh, it, he's a, uh, Tom's a knowledgeable man. If you need an awful lot of context for this question, you're asking the wrong event, and you can ask it another time. So uh, where's the microphone? Let me just make sure that we've actually got it ready to deploy. We do. Uh, we'll take questions two at a time. Uh, so please keep your hands raised. And uh, sir at the front, and then we'll have the gentleman in the fourth row there. Yeah, this gentleman here. Um, and we'll take two at a time. But yeah, go on. Hi there, Tom. You've spoken about the uh, threat of foreign infiltration into British businesses. How big of a threat do you think this is, and how do you think we can best combat it? Model question. Let that serve as the uh, let that serve as an inspiration for all of you. So, there's a gentleman in the fourth along second row. Yes, Charlie, um, Southwood Conservative. I would like to ask if China invade Taiwan, how likely United Kingdom will be involved in the conflict, and in what way? 
one sentence, even better. Right, uh, Tom. Well, those are very connected questions, aren't they? Um, look, the, the reality is we are seeing a direct uh, attack on many, many British businesses every single day. You know about the cyber threat uh, that the UK faces, and I'm afraid a lot of it emerges from uh, Beijing. I'm afraid that's just simply the case. And the reality is it is a real challenge. It is a real challenge. But we have some fantastic services keeping us safe. I mean, I wish I could tell you, forgive me, but I can't. But what GCHQ is doing <coughs> is genuinely phenomenal. And what they are helping British business to uh, use in terms of defence through the National Cybersecurity Centre is absolutely extraordinary. And if you have not been onto their website, may I say, go, ncsc.gov.uk. It is a fantastic service, and it will help keep you safe and keep the whole of the United Kingdom safe. It's hugely important. And to your point, sir, look, I don't, I don't want to predict the future, but I do want to make it quite clear that uh, opposed landings on uh, beaches are extremely difficult. Um, I had the great privilege of serving with uh, his Majesty's, I was about to say Her Majesty's, uh, Royal Marines for many years, and opposed landings on beaches are very, very hard. I very strongly suspect that what we're going to be seeing is not that kind of assault, but a continuation of the kind of pressure uh, that we're seeing at the moment. And what the UK's role is, like the UK's role with every ally, is to assist our friends and partners to make sure they keep themselves safe by shaping, the influence, shaping and influencing the world around and making sure the cyber defences that we're so uh, good at, uh, at supporting are, are, are there for our friends and allies. And can I just say, there are some extraordinarily capable individuals in the Taiwan government. Audrey Tang has been a most fantastic digital minister uh, for the Taiwan government, and I no doubt is even now making sure the Taiwanese people are prepared and ready. So one follow-up for me is, do you think that events in Ukraine have made a Chinese operation in Taiwan more or less likely? It's hard to say, but it's certainly true that uh, it is difficult to draw a lesson that crossing a land border into a neighbouring state uh, is this difficult, and yet crossing a 100 miles of extremely difficult sea onto a mountainous island with only 19 beaches and very narrow defiles of fire would be any easier. Fair enough. OK, let's have another show of hands, please. Um, We'll have the gentleman at the back there and the lady at the back there. The microphone will get to you, but I'm just, I am just going to split it by the room. So, uh, sir. Thank you. I'm Doris Metterling from Kensington, Chelsea in London. Tom Tukenhead has provided the context. The government has proscribed terrorist organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah. Why don't we finally, instead of messing around, sanctioning a handful of Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps people, ban the lot? OK, why don't we ban the entire Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps? And then the lady there, we'll just pass the microphone down. Thank you. Thanks. Um, what do you see, Tom, as the role of um, official development assistance in creating increased security overseas, particularly thinking about um, significant Chinese investment in Africa? OK, let's start off uh, with uh, the IRGC question. Let me be absolutely clear. If you associate with the IRGC, if you side with Iranian intelligence, if you assist any Iranian agent in trying to do harm in this country, we're after you. The National Security Act that we have just introduced means that any assistance, any assistance at all, anything you do to help, whether it's hosting a lunch, whether it's giving them a sweetie, I don't give a damn what it is, if you help the Iranians, we're after you, and it is a criminal offence in this country now. So we're on it. The second thing is uh, ODA. Look. I have mixed views on ODA, and the reason I have mixed views is because the fundamental thing that helps countries succeed is trade. And what we've got to make sure is that when we are uh, looking at how do we get China out of countries that are uh, effectively being colonized by Beijing, we need to make sure that we're giving them alternatives. And that's where I'm incredibly pleased with the work that Kemi's doing and this government is doing in making sure we're extending trade around the world. Our membership of the CPTPP is game-changing. It is a huge change in our position and our standing. It means that we, alongside the Japanese and the Australians, are the three countries who are dominating that trade block. That is really important. It also means that we are free to do many, many areas of work with countries like Kenya and Nigeria, where I think there are huge opportunities for further development. So I'm actually extremely positive 
about the trade opportunities that the UK has and actually that other countries have with the United Kingdom. We are cash rich. We are a country that has huge depths of capital and we need to be deploying it very effectively into areas where young people, talent and energy are hugely productive. And that, yes, that is a bid for me to appear in the next Nollywood film where you will see me appearing, I hope, as a baddie in King of Boys. And if you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix. It's fantastic. Fantastic. I'm just going to pretend I got that reference. And uh, I move on. Let's have another show of hands, please. Very dark Lagos uh, gangster. Oh, fair, fair enough. Sounds terrifying. <laughs> Michael, um, and then the, was the lady there in the front row. Thank you. Um, so, Mike, Michael, if you... There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Would you uh, welcome Nigel Farage into the Conservatives if he was to apply? <laughs> <laughs> One sentence standard again. There we go. And the lady in the pink jacket in the front row there. I feel really bad. I, I was really Thank mean you and now you're all much. being really good. Um, my question is, how, uh, how can UK, as a member in the coalition anti-ISIS based in Eastern Euphrates, in uh, Syria and Iraq, stop the Hashd al-Shaabi for uh, committing atrocities against Kurdish people in Iraq and Syria. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so, on Farage, yes, I welcome all voices. On um, <laughs> competition of ideas, Michael, don't forget. <laughs> and the, back on the back, and those multiple leaders. <laughs> on uh, Hashd al and uh, on the uh, and Daesh in, uh, in, in, in Kurdistan. Look, I, I was in northern Iraq only recently talking to uh, friends and colleagues out there because we're facing a similar challenge. Look, let's not kid ourselves that what's going on uh, in Kurdistan is incredibly remote from the UK. It is actually some of those groups, some of those smuggling groups, which are uh, assisting people to cross the channel illegally and are supporting illegal migration to the UK. So this is directly connected to us. It is also directly connected to us when we see, sadly, that some young Brits have been inspired uh, extraordinarily uh, and very stupidly to go out and uh, fight in Syria. And so our partnership with Kurdistan has been incredibly important, and with the Iraqi government in general, has been incredibly important in keeping us safe. So the work we're doing together, I hope, in fact I know, is keeping the Kurdish people safe and keeping us safe. Okay, a quick uh, supplementary question from me since we're in the region. Is there any uh, danger to Britain? How concerned are you about recent events in Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia? Look, those are really challenging. Um, and, and the reason they're challenging is because we have many very good partnerships with uh, different parties in that area. Look, I'm not going to go into the details of where we are in conversations, but there is uh, a huge amount of goodwill towards those who are uh, escaping at the moment and who are struggling uh, with their futures. Uh, and uh, we're looking for a peaceful resolution. OK, fair enough. Let's have a show of hands again, please. Uh, the gentleman here in the front row and the gentleman there by the, uh, by the television. Thank you. David Rose, Jewish Chronicle. Um, in August, um, an Islamic charity, which has twice been the subject of damning investigative reports from the Charity Commission, organized a group of mullahs to go to Afghanistan. They came back and said how wonderful the Afghan regime is under the Taliban. Um, we've seen the same thing happen at the Islamic Center of England, which is, of course, an Iranian IRGC front. Is it time to revisit charity law so that charities who behave in this way can be simply shut down? Thank you. Um, we're just going to get the... Thank you. Um, you've mentioned uh, North Korea and Pyongyang, and I escaped from that country. And I, You're not popular I, there either. No. <laughs> I could be a very dangerous person in this room. <laughs> well, and I'm, I'm attending this conference as a CCHQ member and staff, so I'm very grateful. But my question is, in 2017, how many 64 NHS hospitals attacked by North Korea's hacking and all the power went down? And I'm wondering, North Korea continue to develop into hacking around the world, and there are over 7,000 professional hackers, and how Britain, I know we have embassies in, in, in London, how we deal with this case. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David, your question on char charity law is a fair one. Actually, the main thing I'd say is that the Charity Commission, which is doing a good job, needs greater resources. And this is a challenge that they've had, uh, but they've done a huge amount in recent years in helping us to control and, if you like, use the Al Capone method on, on certain organizations, getting people on perhaps what might be called technicalities, but actually is making sure that 
uh, organisations that are promoting causes that are frankly uh, inimicable with British values are closed down. And there are elements in charity law already which allow them to do that, but it is difficult to do that work and they do need a uh, resource to do it. And so helping them is important. On your question about North Korea, let's not kid ourselves. North Korea isn't a state in any normal sense. It's a criminal enterprise uh, with territory. It's a, it's a, a, a mafia family uh, that has managed to occupy uh, a piece of land and, frankly, is the largest slave-owning state in the entire world. Uh, the entire population has sadly been enslaved to the Kim family for many generations now. What we uh, are doing is... Uh, I can't go into too much, forgive me, but... Um, the, uh, the principal vector of attack from North Korea is, as you say, cyber, and we have uh, a lot of work uh, on there. And it's perhaps just worth saying, uh, to your point as well, David, on Afghanistan, let me be quite clear what's going on in Afghanistan today. Let me be quite clear why we were there and why I was so angry when I gave a speech in the House of Commons uh, only a year or two ago, and why, frankly, I'm, it makes me angry even to think about it now. When I was in Afghanistan, I worked with some extraordinarily impressive uh, men and women in courts, in parliaments, in international organizations, in any number of different ways in businesses. The Taliban have killed so many of my friends, have murdered so many people who we knew and we supported, and have turned what was uh, a burgeoning, emerging society free society with, yes, huge problems. I'm not going to kid you. Huge problems. But it was beginning to transform. And they've turned it once more into a vicious prison state. They have ended the hopes of women and girls. They have silenced the voices of millions. And they have, to use that old metaphor, they have made a desert and called it peace. Let's not pretend that what we're seeing in Afghanistan today is anything other than a brutal dictatorship under a hateful death cult. That's what we're seeing today. Thank you very much. Um, show of hands, we'll have the, the lady there standing in the aisle with the red coat, the microphone's just on its way, and then the gentleman there in the second row. Uh, Excellency, I'm, uh, my name is Joanne. I'm Deputy Ambassador of Iraq. I want to thank you very much for your nice words and uh, very good impression you had when you visited my country. And uh, what we received from back home, that there were very constructive uh, talks and dialogue with Your Excellency. And uh, uh, we are looking forward for s to uh, signing some uh, memorandum of understanding. Inshallah. Inshallah. And uh, I just wanted to know to what extent that we are going to have that in the near future. And also some of your comments on Al Hol camp. Mm. Uh, if you have, sure. uh, how, how can we solve this uh, very big problem? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And the, gent the gentleman there in, this, in the second row. Hi there. It does have um, something to do with trade, but security may come into it. What, what do we need to be concerned about BRICS and, and the situation with that across the world? There we go. Thank you. Okay. Um, look, uh, there's a huge amount we need to do more with Iraq. And um, my trip to Baghdad was fantastic. It was really, um, it was nice to be back. It was my first time back in 20 years. And last time I wasn't made quite as welcome. Um, so <laughs> it, was, uh, it was very good to come back as a friend. And, um, and it was good to see so many people who's, who've genuinely transformed their lives. I mean, seeing people like the Chief Justice or the Minister of Defense and seeing what a difference they have made, it is incomparable from um, the time under Saddam Hussein when it was, I mean, genuinely people were being murdered in their thousands. Uh, and to see the emergence of civil society and a, and a democracy in Iraq is really very very encouraging. Look, on Al Hol camp, I have, it's not going to surprise you, but I have very mixed views. Um, Could you just clarify what that is? Sorry, Al Hol camp is one of the camps in northern Syria where some of the uh, ISIS fighters have been taken and are currently <coughs> being held by uh, members of different uh, Kurdish groups. And some people there are um, British, including uh, Shamima Begum. I have very mixed views for, one, for two reasons. One is, look, of course people who haven't chosen to be there, children in particular, should be able to come back to the United Kingdom, and we're working to help them to do so. But there are some people who've chosen to go to fight for ISIS, chosen to go 
and join a death cult and are now bitterly regretting it, understandably. But frankly, we're not quite sure how much they really do regret it. And my priority is and will always remain the security of the British people and the security of the British state. And while I may feel sorry for them, my priority has to be the security of those who did not choose to join a death cult, those who did not choose to go and fight for our enemies, and those who did not choose to try and murder people in foreign climes. So uh, you'll understand it's a, it's a difficult situation. I appreciate that. But it is my priority is the security of the British state, and that w is where it will remain. On BRICS, look, I, I have to say I, I found the BRICS meeting very interesting. Um, its expansion I didn't take as a sign of strength, but a sign that uh, as a, an organization of five, it was not particularly productive, uh, and so an attempt to extend. And what was interesting was not all of the members of the original five seemed to particularly agree on the expansion either. So I took it as uh, uh, rather more negative than it was advertised. Thank you. So we'll have another show of hands, please. Uh, we'll have the gentleman here in the front row and the uh, gentleman there in the third row. Yeah, uh, please just um, keep your hand, well, don't keep your hand up because it might be a little while, but go. Hello, Tom. I'm David Adams from Warwickshire. We have certain advantages in dealings with India. India is on the cusp of being a, an, an econ economic miracle and could act as a counterbalance to China. Why don't we get on with it? Thank you. Fair point. Ex another excellent question. And uh, the gentleman there, would you just raise your hand, sir? There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Tom, a, a question that will come as no surprise to you coming from me. Um, what is your message to Hong Kongers who have come to this country, uh, thanks uh, largely to the government's BNO scheme, uh, expecting to live in freedom and security, and actually are facing uh, in a number of instances, security threats, and of course, even in some cases, bounties and arrest warrants. And, and what more can we do to protect them? Thank you. Okay, let me start off with India and say it's an entirely fair question, uh, except for one thing, we're doing a huge amount on India, and we're doing it because it matters. I was recently in Delhi talking to my opposite numbers, and it was a huge privilege to have time uh, with them. It is a fantastic country, as uh, many of us recognize, and it has got huge challenges, as you would expect, of a country of 1.3, 1.4 billion people. And it is difficult to work with a country that large, where each of the federal states is larger than most <laughs> of the European countries. So it is, it is difficult. Um, but it's certainly true that we're getting new opportunities. And uh, if I may, uh, unusually uh, for a political event, pay tribute to some colleagues. Alex Chalk has done some fantastic work on legal services agreement. Kemi Badnock is doing a marvellous job on making sure we're getting business links. And frankly, if you want to know who's got a fantastic relationship with the Indian government, look at our Prime Minister. Rishi has done a huge amount to turn that relationship around and to build on it, and it's really, really good to see. And uh, you may think uh, Rishi's a rock star here. I tell you what, go to Delhi. <laughs> it's extraordinary. They absolutely adore him, and quite rightly. Um, on Hong Kongers, look, as you know very well, Ben, one of my proudest things when I was chairing the Foreign Affairs Committee was campaigning to change the BNO law and to make sure we got, uh, we gave, or rather restored, what should have always been the case, which was that um, British nationals who happened to be overseas were treated as British nationals should be treated and were allowed to come here. So it was great to see Hong Kongers come here. But you're absolutely right that the problem of what we're calling transnational repression, it's not a great title, so if anybody can think of a better way of doing it. Uh, foreign influence, something like that. Um, those who are being abused by the Chinese state or threatened by the Chinese state here do deserve the full protection of the British state, and we are working on that. It's tricky, and the reason it's tricky is because, of course, many people have family in areas where we simply don't have reach, either in Hong Kong or sometimes even in mainland China. So it's not for me to tell people the risks that they should take. What we are doing is making sure that those who are here are free here. And that is absolutely front of mind for all of us. Okay, another show. BNO law. Sorry? BNO. Sorry, British nationals overseas. Can you remember, we don't all know the initials. Sorry, I use the phrase. No, 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 right. Normally it's my job to have no idea what the acronyms are, but sadly I did know that one and so I was caught out. I'm very, I'm very sorry. That's, no, that's my failure as chair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very sorry, sir. We'll have the, the lady there in, in the green shirt and the gentleman there at the back, please. Uh, just let the microphone reach you. 
And, and while that's going on, I'm going to ask. I'm going to make this three because I'm going to throw in a supplementary one of my own. Oh, okay. Um, if you believe that BNO uh, passport holders should uh, should have uh, equal rights of other British citizens, then why is that not the same for BOC passport holders? There's more than one second-class British passport. There are people holding BOC passports who are in effect rendered stateless because the Malaysian government won't let them back in. Why don't we simply roll them all into one common citizenship? BOC is British Overseas Citizen. It's the second class passport we gave to, I think, mostly Chinese uh, extraction people in Malaya uh, when we left. But there's about five different types of British passport. It's, it's quite incredible. Uh, Madam. Um, Alona Hlevko, former Ukrainian MP, now Managing Director of the Henry Jackson Society here in London. Um, the UK has been the strongest ally of Ukraine since 2014, the beginning of this war. And we've constantly seen Russian propaganda saying how they would eliminate the UK into nuclear threat and how they would try to fearmonger all the time and make various threats to the UK, but not never going beyond words. Have you actually encountered any serious attacks or threats coming from Russia within this nine period of war? As much as you can share. Thank you. And the, 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 it's going to the gentleman in the corner there, I think. So we can just pass the, there we go. Normally we have two. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Tom, do you envisage any circumstances that might give rise to a necessity to license access to the World Wide Web, and in fact, access from the World Wide Web for security reasons? Wow. Well, that's the technical Tom? question. Um, so I'll start with the second question, which is I can't see how we would achieve that. Um, the fact is it's such a distributed network. I'm not sure how you would do that. It's, I'm not sure it's possible. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not quite sure I can answer it any more than that. Uh, on, on your point on Ukraine, look, the reason that the UK is so committed to Ukraine, I think, is for exactly the reason that President Zelensky mentioned when he came and spoke to our parliament, which is that it is in our memory those days when Britain fought alone in 4041. And to see Ukraine standing strong against uh, 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 totalitarian dictatorship today brings back, for many of us, echoes of that period. So it's hugely powerful and resonant for us. And, you know, to quote our great leader of that period, you know, we've, we've had threats before. You know, we've had people who say that they're going to wring our neck like a chicken. And as Churchill put it, some chicken, some neck. Uh, what about the, uh, I'm going to press you on my one. Well, why don't we do the same thing for BOC holders that we do for BNO passports? Uh, because nobody's raised it with me. I have now. You now have. Excellent. I'm looking forward to swift progress. Right. <laughs> uh, right, I'm going to, I like Icarus, I'm going to try one more round of questions. We have about five minutes, so uh, let's see what we can do. Final show of hands, please. Uh, opposite ends of the room is probably impractical. I'm very sorry, sir. We're going to have the lady in the third row there. And we're going to have, I think there was a hand raised over there, was there? Yes, we'll have that gentleman there. Right, Adam. Um, so UK security and European security more widely is obviously uh, threatened by Russia, but it might also be threatened by a Trump 2.0 um, administration that isn't as committed to NATO. What can the UK do to be more resilient and what role could and should the EU play in it? Thank you. And then over there. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Mitchell from Carlisle. Tens of thousands are traversing the EU and ending up on our shores as illegals, many of them from very suspect countries. What's your assessment of the numbers of those who have arrived here with ill intent? Okay, um, let me take the EU European Partnership on Defence question there um, and the challenge of the United States. Look, my belief is that the United States tends to do the right thing after it's tried everything else. Um, and, and they've certainly tried a few things recently. Um, but I think, I think one of the points that the last few years, and certainly the thinking into next year, should be reminding us is that many of us, many countries in Europe, have been free riders on American defense for too long. And the reality is that quite a lot of European welfare is paid for by US armaments. Uh, and it's not always recognized. So I think this is one of those moments where many of us need to realize that spending on defense is not a luxury. It is a fundamental duty of a government to keep ourselves safe. This is not an extra. 
It is not something we can negotiate away, and it's not something we can buy in at the last minute. A defence industrial complex, as the expression goes, needs to be operating all the time. It can't just be switched on and switched off. And many countries have discovered that the support we've given to Ukraine, which, by the way, I think is absolutely essential to our own security, not just to Ukraine's, uh, has meant that they are unable to maintain uh, the war stocks that they need for their own use. Uh, and they can't switch it back on because the factories aren't making or the, 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 you know, the supplies aren't there. And so this is a really important lesson for all of us, I think, and, and many of our European partners in particular, that they have had the great good fortune to live under an American umbrella for 70, 80 years, uh, and they need to think about their own roof as well. So I think there's a, this is a, a, a very apt moment to think about what we need to do ourselves. Um, the second question was about um, ill intent. We keep a very close eye on this, as you can imagine, and uh, so far that's not an issue that... Uh, <coughs> has arisen in a way that uh, would give me enormous concern, but it doesn't mean that I am not eternally concerned about illegal migration. And this is where the work that we've done with European partners, and here uh, can I just pay a huge tribute to Rob Jenrick and to Suella Braverman uh, for the work that they have done. Because the work that they have done in building up relationships with our European partners has been incredibly important. And Rob has been in North Africa, in Libya, and Turkey. I've been in Iraq uh, on a similar basis. Um, and Rob's been to Egypt as well. And what we're doing there is we're looking upstream and seeing what we can do to make sure that we're keeping ourselves safe uh, by working with partners upstream. Because the reality is you can't stop the, you know, you, you can't just close the border at the last minute. What you've got to be doing is working upstream to make sure that the pressures on other countries uh, are eased. And I should also pay enormous tribute to the Prime Minister because the Prime Minister's relationship with President Macron in France has been transformative. And the way he has engaged with uh, the French government and the way Suella has engaged with Minister Darmanin in Paris has been transformative in the way that the French have been cooperative on their northern border. It has been hugely important. And I think we should recognise uh, Suella's diplomatic skills and the Prime Minister's uh, ability to reach across the aisle there. And you coast to a conclusion exactly on the hour, like a, like a true professional. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's the end of our allotted time. Please join me in showing the first appreciation to Tom. Thank you for joining Conservative Home. I hope you've enjoyed our events roster. I, we, there's, maybe a hand, there's maybe a handful left, but this is one of the last of mine. So uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, work, do the, all this with you over the last couple of days. Enjoy the rest of conference. Thank you. I thought he was about to say that to me. <laughs> I'm sorry not to disappoint, Michael. Yeah.